The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So I'd like to welcome everybody who's come here today. Some of you I haven't seen for a very long time, so nice to see you here. And uh, thank you for inviting me from BSV. Now today I want to talk about something I've talked about on different levels for many times, but today I want to talk about it from a specific perspective. So how to bring compassion into your interactions with others. And there was a, a very wonderful model that has been created um, with the Apaya community in America with Joan Halifax, and they call it grace. And I will go into talking about what grace is, but I'll just, um, that's the acronym of grace. I will just share a little bit of what compassion is for both Theravada and Mahayana, and what it is um, about it that we can actually utilize. And I'm giving this talk because I came across a situation recently, which I'll touch on, that left both myself and another person a little vulnerable. The person with a lot of needs and great um, expectations. Uh, I don't think it was fulfilled in, in this um, coming together, and nor was I. And so this has inspired this talk, and I will talk to that as we go along. So the GRACE model will help you to actualize compassion in your own life, and that the impact of this will ripple out to the benefits of people in your family and other friends and in your work colleagues, and to countless others, really. From a Buddhist perspective, compassion is the result of knowing's one, knowing one's part of the greater whole. That means that once we have that capacity to recognize ourselves in others and in the world, then we can also respond to the suffering and pain that arises in and around us. And this is very poignant at this time. And it is independent, uh, we are independent and connected to the whole. It is the result of practicing meditation that we come to fully realize this. Indeed, Buddhist compassion should be without heat and passion. It's not about, often they say that the Buddhist compassion is a little cold, <laughs> because it's not about... Um, just one aspect of compassion, which is love or loving kindness. It's about the capacity to heal both yourself and other in an interaction. It is objective, it is constant, and it is universal. In Mahayana, compassion, which is also called karuna, is about connecting to the suffering of all sentient beings with wisdom. It is necessarily a necessary requirement for the progress along the Bodhisattva path. And I think it's a necessary requirement, along with wisdom, in the path for Nibbana. Without compassion, one cannot gain the deep um, understanding of that peace within. A very great scholar and practitioner of the uh, seventh century from the sixth 100 to 650, was uh, Chandrakirti, And he wrote, the mind of compassion, non-duality and enlightenment are the causes for becoming a bodhisattva. Kindness is considered to be the seed of an abundant harvest, which is Buddhahood. Like water that cease, that causes it to flow over a long time, and ripple in the state of joy. 
For this reason, I will praise compassionate from the outset. He puts compassion as the foundation to all our, compa all our practice and our path to awakening. In Theravada Buddhism, also this word karuna is talking to the four great abodes called the Brahma Viharas. Compassion is one aspect, loving kindness, metta, sympathetic joy, is mudita and equanimity, upeka, make up what is the broader idea of compassion, the depth of compassion, and the activity of compassion. And also the joy, you know, we often forget that the development of compassion brings great joy, which is what I've talked about many times. The foundation, the beginning of the Bodhisattva path is that first bhumi is the bhumi of great joy. When one develops these four states, the Buddha counseled to radiate them out in all, all directions. This is a loving kindness type of meditation. He keeps pervading the first in, in the first direction and the second and third and fourth with an awareness imbued with compassion. Thus, he keeps pervading above and below and all around and everywhere in every respect, all-encompassing cosmos with an awareness imbued with compassion, abundant, expansive, immeasurable, and free from hostility and ill will. So... It is not just the loving-kindness meditation, it is those four aspects of the great abiding, the Brahma-viharas, that we are medit when we're doing loving-kindness meditation, we should be actually contemplating the great suffering of the world, the great um, ills of the world. And particularly now, this is something in this last year Apart from what we read in the news all the time, this is something, a very lived situation for most of us in the world on some level. But today I want to talk more about um, models to develop, ways to develop this compassion in our work and how to overcome being judgmental, discriminative, reactive, and causing our mental anguish on others to suffer, apart from what it does to our own minds. So we start by being attentive, and opening and grounding in ourselves. This is something in every time we meet and communicate in our workplace, in our home, in our families and loved ones. We just ground ourselves when we are about to open our mouth. We observe, we look, we respond to the present situation. That includes the other person. And we bring to mind an intention or a motivation. It sounds complicated, but there is a process to do this. And it is really within the mindful process where we do develop this intention and motivation and presence of mind. There's a resonance of feelings and the capacity to listen. And we also consider what it is we can give to this situation. Of course, to begin with deep listening, it can help. And then to develop the skills, the skillful means to engage, the means to communicate in a way that is non-harming and that is kind. And in an ethical way, a way that is of benefit when we think of ethics, there is uh, so many layers to this, and I wish it was taught in schools. But an ethical way of being a full human being, it is within our five precepts or in the 
depending on how many precepts you take in whatever tradition. It is laid out in these precepts, but it is even more. It is how to take care of, be attentive to, to work with in a way that alleviates and brings joy and peace to the situation. And also to remember that compassion is unconditional. It's not bound by conditions. So the grace model laid out five elements. One is to gather the attention, to focus, and as I mentioned, grounding one's place, grounding oneself with a balanced mind, with equanimity. The second is recalling our purpose to be there, the intention for this interaction. Why are we here? What are we wanting to gain? And this will help resource the motivation, will help inspire a motivation within us to communicate in an appropriate way. It's also attuning ourselves to one and the other. You know what it is energetically uh, going on here. So we have some sort of uh, an effective resonance, as they say here, an effective cordial um, in a responding and considering how and what it is we will give in a way of service. So how are we going to give to this situation? And the fifth is to engage ethically, enhance in an enhancing way and an enabling way. So one of the very founding aspects to this that I found incredibly beneficial was to know how much I really do listen, to understand, am I really listening or am I really wanting to project my thoughts, my wisdom, my experience? A lot of the time, it is not necessarily useful to the other person. Our expertise and our knowledge and what it is that we have brought with us sometimes is overwhelming. And is I find often with Buddhist teachers, including myself, we often give too much. And it is not so beneficial. And I've been actually considering this lately. Anyway, I want to do a little exercise, just a short meditation. And when I, and this is, you know, given out quite a lot in this uh, practice, especially to people who are in chaplaincy or working in healthcare and human rights and teachers and so forth and doctors. When they're working with this model, they have found this little exercise to be very useful. So I thought, let's have a go. Now, won't you just to relax into a meditation and take a breath, just putting your feet in a way that you're aware where your body is sitting. Many of you are already meditating, so just to take a deep breath and just let it go. And I'll ask you these questions as we go along. The first one is, recall an encounter as vividly as you can with someone. It may not have been an easy encounter or one that you found difficult to engage in. And ask yourself, what was this other person hoping for? What was this other person wanting, expecting of you?
And I want you to just respond. I don't know. I don't know. Just notice how that feels in your body with that response. You're in this engagement, in a conversation or a a situation. Observing that other person and when you ask yourself what were they wanting, the answer for you is I don't know. The second question, did this person trust you or believe in you? Do they trust you and believe in you? And again, responding, I don't know. Take a couple of breaths, just breathing in. As we're breathing out, just sinking more deeply into your body. Into that I don't know mind. The third is, question is, is there something going on in your thoughts, a reactive engaging thinking process, or even the mind is shouting at the moment, asking for what's this, and just listen observing the situation more carefully or noting the thinking mind and again just answer I don't know Noting what's happening in your body. As the mind is imbued more with a not knowing. The fourth question is, what were you hoping for? What outcome did you want of this situation? I don't know. Noticing any internal responses to that, thoughts and feelings or discomfort. Nothing to change, just observing. With a not knowing or an I don't know mind. Again, bringing your attention to your breath and breathing in. And as we breathe out, we just enter the body more deeply, more fully. Noting whether the thoughts have become more still, the body more relaxed.
and ask this question, to what extent did you trust this person? Did you feel you were engaged with this person in this situation? Did you feel you were communicating in some way? And we answer again, I don't know. Just letting it go. And the last question, what could be a good outcome for this person and for yourself? And the answer, again, is I don't know. I want you to just simply reflect a little on what has happened in this space for you. It's a practice in a form of practice similar to what I learned to practice in my 20 years in Korea, but this has been developed for people in the service of others. We often are left with he or she said this or that and I said this. We carry that with us. But here we're just allowing whatever happened to just happen, just be there. Sometimes it can be quite liberating to not have so much resistance, allow the heart to open a little. More headspace rather than arguing or demanding of others' attention. And it can offer us more energy Does anyone want to speak to that? Anyone have a particular something arise for them in this situation? I think you're still meditating, so. <laughs> but it can also cause us to be quite humble or humbled by it and by another. We, we often wound ourselves in these interactions. And I just want to speak a little to this Vietnamese story because it was a little unusual that um, such a situation happened, not completely unusual, but more unusual, that somebody comes and wants some help. But actually they came with a very set conviction of what they wanted. In this case, to run away from home and come and stay for a while. When home, there was a lot of responsibility. Home was where somebody was the, this person was the caregiver to two people, overwhelmed. completely stressed and beside her capacity. However, she could speak very little English and came with uh, a friend who translated. 
And I listened very carefully, trying to hear what it was she was wanting and asking questions, the questions I thought appropriate to the situation. But what I found was her mind was determined for one outcome. And I realized that outcome would not be beneficial for her. She had no means of transport. She had not prepared for others to look after the people she was caring for. And so I had to be a little stronger than I normally would be in such a situation. Normally I would say, well, come for one or two nights, see how you are. You know, I can drive you home when you want. And I suggested that she first take care of the situation of people to look after those who depend on her. And then if she wanted a period of time to let me know and come back. So I set up very clear guidelines of what could work and what should happen. But she was deeply disappointed And it's interesting, that disappointment stayed with me. I carried that. Did I do the right thing? Now, this can happen to all of us in whatever whatever situation it is for us. A family member wanting something, a child wanting something a parent to children (laughs) relation, or always in this situation, a child wanting to run away from home. (laughs) And of course, we come to that discussion with great consideration and care and reflection. But the interesting thing was, I never heard from her again. So often that is a telling thing, you know, if it had, and there was very much an open invitation for further conversation and support if she needed it. However, I think I felt a little vulnerable. And that was part of what the stickiness of the situation was. And when I started to look at this, I discovered there is a very important thing in the last of these four facets of grace, which I will touch on in a moment. So the first one of grace is gathering your attention. It is, you know, the capacity to be here. Be present, as we all know, and just breathing in a in a way that makes us feel grounded and empowered in the moment, and focusing on attention. The attention is such an important thing in meditation. We talk about attention, 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 presence of mind in this moment on the subject we are observing. But here you can just, in a moment before you start to engage in a business relationship or in a situation that is another is suffering or you're suffering, just to feel into the body, feeling the hands, the feet, the bottom on the chair, finding those spaces that just ground you a little. And the second kind of attention is that sort of receptive and openness, like just opening a space, you know, or expanding the mind to take in much more than just that person. This quality of attention is uh, in meditation, it's something that not only broadens, but it softens the situation softens the body, it softens our focus. If we focus too attentively, there's an aggression in there. 
there's something that's demanding something. And in the case of this woman, that was very much her focus, a strong, aggressive, angry and demanding situation for me to help her. And it also requires, oops, lost my, a bearing witness, what we call bearing witness. A bearing witness is the allow, where we allow all the perceptions to flow and we don't, it's that don't know mind that we've just touched on. We don't engage with any of it. We just allow the emotions, the anger, whatever is arising, to just be as it is, we're not going to change it and we're not going to engage in it. And the second one is to recall an intention. So why have we come together? Bringing to mind what is that intention? What is it we're wanting to achieve? If I have somebody come with a problem my intention is not necessarily to resolve that problem, but to be present and engage. The problem itself may resolve by its own. If we don't have some sort of an intention, what can happen is we can get what is called an empathetic overload. We can overtake on the emotional feelings of that other person and we get an empathetic distress, which can have a huge reaction within us. And that's the problem with many people in the nursing and medical fields or in the, um, the caring fields. And offering, uh, suffering has gone, um, has not been addressed for a long time. And it sort of sinks into, into many parts of ourselves, into how we work and think and react. And the third is, and of course, you know, we want to bring the, the depth of our loving kindness, the depth of our compassion to the, every situation, um, so we can deal with that negativity. But we have to have that present for us and to attune, which is to checking in with, you know, what it is I can do, how I feel. In a non, in an observing and non-judgmental way, I don't, you know, uh, most of us don't mind interacting with people, providing we feel we have the capacity to do so. There are actually four other capacities in, in this attunement. One is to attend to the experience of the other. Another is to value, the value of an attentional balance, which means the equanimity we bring to it, the, the balanced mind, the perspective that's not too aggressive and not too passive to be able to clearly and vividly see into the situation, which is usually coming from the capacity to meditate and have the mind bright and clear, and a willingness, a willingness to, and an ability to exchange oneself for others. This is the core primary perspective of um, compassion in Mahayana Buddhism. Great teacher, where we said, the wise don't judge, they just seek to understand the whole. And I think I found that a lot in Korea. You know, often I would meet masters who, when you go into the room, it's, a, it's an empty house. They're just sitting there, poised in that space, in that empty room, bright and present and aware, not expecting you to do something or necessarily say something. If something arises in that space, they responded. If it didn't, they responded in a different way, often with a cup of tea. And four, 
What will really serve that other person? That's a very interesting thing. What is it I can really do that will help that other person? Often we expend enormous amount of energy. As I mentioned earlier, trying to change another's view or trying to impart our great wisdom on another, of which they're not receptive. So what is it? <coughs> it requires a lot of space, observing, noticing, and just being with the situation. We don't always have joy and clarity in our relationships, in our communication, but at least we can listen and listen deeply, you know, which is very, very important. When you help, you can see a situation is lightening up when you actually are helping. But trying to fix something is not the correct way. It is a weaker means of communication when we try to fix something, try to make it right. Of course, we're always disappointed. It's like when you see something broken, we want to fix it. So it is always better to enter into the whole, allowing that which is not perfect, that which is suffering and broken to be there just as it is. And when you work, someone who works in a situation of intense suffering, we can often become quite numb. I remember listening to one lady speaking who worked in an ambulance and she said you know there's especially when with children in very critical situations she did all she had to do in getting the child to the hospital but when she got to the hospital she realized she hadn't finished that relationship up to that point. She just turned away and continued on to the next. So she would be carrying something all the time from those experiences that had not come to some completion, which is so important. I had a situation with my dentist recently and she was going to do a particular procedure and then she wanted to do extra checks and um, x-rays. And then she wanted me to go and see a specialist to check out something, a tooth that I'd actually had work, work done on recently. And then after all of this, she said, really, you have teeth under those gold caps that I think probably have to come out. <laughs> So here I am arguing the point of why I need to keep my teeth in my mouth. <laughs> and I don't really want to have my teeth pulled. <laughs> so here I'm on the other side where, where I'm the person who is, she's trying to explain something very carefully, <laughs> very caringly, and I'm not necessarily accepting it. So I had to look at this too. Hmm. So in this case, you know, a compassionate action comes when we can let go of our self-interest here. Although in this case, it is my teeth. So I, I want other, other views about it too. But what we draw from in this last, in this um, engaging and enacting aspect of it is we're often deeply rooted in the conflicts because we have a goal in mind, we have an outcome that we want to have, we have something that, you know, is bearing a reality upon us, but we are really wanting to enter into that crack, 
to enter into that situation where there is a little bit of capacity for real communication to happen. As they say, you know, it's only when the, there's a crack that the light can get in. There's only at that time where we can both stand back a little bit and pause. And this is what happened in the dentist. We both sat back and paused and thought, we'll just take it to the next level, the next check. And ending, as I mentioned, that ending of interactions, that capacity to actually uh, finish something completely, not just walk away, not just turn away. So the advice to that lady ambulance nurse was to take a moment to wish that child well or to touch that child in a way that you're offering a, a parting wish for the, the wellness and, and great benefit of the outcome of that child or in any situation, even if we have a conflict, not to turn away but to pause, to take a breath to recognize there may be a difference, and that's okay. In Huang Po's words, when thoughts arise, then all things arise, and when thoughts vanish, all things also vanish. And Joan Halifax, who was one of the main developers of this process, said, compassion is the capacity to attend to the experience of others to feel concern for others, to be able to really sense into what will serve others and to also have the capacity to serve both directly and indirectly. The indirectly would mean how we give a thought at the end of a meeting or how, what we do in the process is coming up to engaging not necessarily directly, but indirectly. So developing this capacity makes it possible for us to help. There's a few skillful ways and effective ways that compassion also helps us. Being affiliated and connected in ways, developing ways in that we haven't, you know, beyond just the habitual distractibility that we always have, where we're always thinking and trying to work it out and trying to gain leverage for ourselves, we slowly can actually develop a, a way to connect with the situation, every situation, which I've talked about many times, this situation and then this situation, where we connect. We engage, we're present, we're attentive, and we're right there with it. And so in that little meditation where you engaged, went back in a memory of engaging with somebody by not adding anything to it, you were just connecting, just there. The I don't know what it does, it just embraces the situation as it is, without your valuations, without your judgments or expectations. No hopes and fears and expectations. And we can sustain a very vivid, grounded insight into a situation by just that presence. It's called a, she called it a grandmother's heart. The grandmother has a big heart. She has a strong back and a soft front and a big heart. That's because she's gone through many experiences in life. Great amount of suffering and loss. So she can just be with anything and anyone and embrace that. And don't just act 
on behavioural elements of compassion. I mean, don't just act by the book. Don't just act in the way that you think compassion is. We hear the word over and over again. But it's often... I remember seeing once a Theravada Buddhist, you know, complaining terribly about Mahayana. And then there was this little paragraph (laughs) towards the end. And it said, I really wish Theravada could learn from Mahayana about compassion. (laughs) It was really, you know, then it went on about, you know, how how bad Mahayana was. But this one little paragraph stood out and I still remember it. (laughs) He felt something was lacking there. Mm. And it does require effort and the ability not to be afraid and also not, as I mentioned, to think we can always help and fix it and find solutions. But in fact, the ability to give something to the situation is the point. Without necessarily expectations of return. And often we're liberating a grasping and a gripping and the aggression that can go on in a lot of the hidden aggression in a lot of communication. To some degree, we also do need some firmness. And I think that's what I was presenting. But I realized in the case with the Vietnamese lady, the more demanding and the more passionate and the stories unfolding, far from what I thought it was in the beginning, then the more overly firm in a way, the more determined I was becoming (laughs) the more upright I was becoming the more I was thinking now how can we help resolve this with this person and just holding that space is often enough it's enough for ourselves and it is enough for the other person especially you know just holding the space with a child who hasn't yet understand all the complexities of the world or holding the space for somebody you you meet by chance who's very distressed holding the space for a partner who is not coherent in a moment or beside themselves is often enough I'll just finish with this poem Right on the dot of ten. Hmm. Where is it? <clears throat> I've occasionally read from this book, May All Beings Be Happy. It was by one of my Dharma uncles. He was a great hermit, a great poet and writer, and also became a very famous Zen master in career in his later life. But he lived... A v- a very frugal life, a rather hard life. Um, he always lived in hermitages and uh, in great simplicity and always had a, an open door to people who needed to come and talk. That included me at times. He lived on the other side of the mountain to where I lived. So when I had a problem or needing a little bit of wise encouragement I would go and he would make beautiful tea and share something very profound often very few words again in this poem it is called who is that behind me there is always an eye watching me carefully without beginning or end passing through this hazy mist of time, night or day, observing me in fine detail. There is that I. Who is that? Do not try to confine it within the frame of language. Deeper and deeper examine who it is. Do not become estranged from that which watches you. Become one with it. In this way, your life becomes new, moment by moment. 
no matter what I say, whether careless or with a sincere intention, right next to me, there is an ear of listening. I could give you that thing, I could give that thing a name, maybe God, or I could call it soul or Buddha nature. The words that someone says immediately open up that person's inner mind and makes it visible. Through their words, the world of their inner mind shattered and unfolds upon itself is made known to me. This self of yours, soiled and worn out by daily life, when and with what can it be restored? Grow accustomed to the habit of closing your mouth and listening carefully. So, a little bit to reflect on there today. Um, thank you for listening and partaking. And... May it uh, come upon, upon you from time to time when you're engaging again. And thank you. And thank you for your support. Every month I come, everyone gives a little. So I get through the next month, <laughs> pay some <laughs> unexpected bills. <laughs> but uh, more important is the fact that you come to the BSV. And you come and you sit and you practice together, you meditate, and you listen to Dhamma. This is the most important thing. So thank you, and I look forward to seeing you another time. Oh, there's one message. No, no, any questions? Oh, any questions? Oh, okay, we forgot about questions, sure. <laughs> you might forget tomorrow night meditation, Monday night meditation will be guided, will be led by Ah oh, yes, you have you, you have meditation, yeah. Live stream from King Lake, but you won't see me. You'll just hear me. I believe the meditation. There's no look, just listening. <laughs> Oh, I don't know if there's any questions today. We, everyone's been quite absorbed, <laughs> just quietly listening. It was a little quieter Dharma talk today, but thank you for being with it. Many blessings to you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Um, yes. Yes, you can have a question. <coughs> may not be recorded, but you can have a question. <laughs> uh, this is quite a general question. Yeah. So often here, which, which uh, Jiguan Sunin has brought up just now, can you hear me? Yeah, um, lift, lift the mic so yeah. you, you don't have to. No, we're not supposed to touch it anyway, but it's okay. Yeah. But uh, it's okay. It, it is often said that uh, Mahayana emphasized a lot about compassion. As a result, a lot of people thought that, or a lot of people think that Mahayana um, practice of compassion is far greater than the, than Theravada practice on compassion. <laughs> so what is Chikwan Sunim thought on this <laughs> sentence and which was also mentioned in yeah, one yeah. of your talks just now? Well, I think you know my thoughts. <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here if, if, I, if I thought Mahayana was the only... <laughs> no, you know, this is really... Um, there are very skillful means for people to develop compassion, whether it be through Mahayana or Theravada. But I don't, that was just a comment, you know. And that person obviously clearly had some uh, many, you know, uh, thoughts about Mahayana Buddhism. But often when people have a lot of strong disagreements in one way or another, it is usually because they haven't um, had the opportunity to experience the other traditions or understand the other tradition properly.
Compassion comes out of your own development of, of meditation and wisdom and your capacity to not only empathize or have empathy with another, but the, compass the capacity to um, have those other aspects, the loving kindness, the, the selfless joy, and so forth. It is, it actually doesn't have that much to do with the tradition, other than perhaps in Mahayana they do do a lot of practices to specific practices to develop um, ways and means to embody the compassion from the bodhisattva perspective. It is one of the things, rather than that intensive um, undertaking for the Nibbanic path, <coughs> the cessation of the, uh, of the Kalesa, and the the um, the eradication of um, of faults or defaults in 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 Theravada meditation practice, it has this sort of broader view of taking in the point of of the suffering of many beings, you know, a self as other in the sense of the bigger self as other. So in Mahayana they. They do emphasize that as part of the bodhisattva practice. But when you actually see any great Theravada teacher, that's what they are and that's what they're doing. You know, there's, there's not, they're already a developed, what we'd say developed bodhisattva, you know, they're developed teacher, they're developed in their compassion, they're developed in their capacity to listen and be with and, you know, um, help others overcome their their delusion. So I don't see it in that quite that linear way, but I do see the two paths do have uh, uh, certain focuses. You know, they have certain goals. But most of us, let's take where we are, right sitting here in our lives, <laughs> most of us are a little bit Mahayana, a little bit Theravada. <laughs> Most of us are not yet an Arahan. <laughs> Put up your hand if you want. <laughs> I certainly want to meet you. <laughs> and most of us are not, you know, highly deeply skilled bodhisattvas. But many of you sitting in front of me work in professions of great care and great support and love of other. You know, so I don't see it one against the other or one counteracting the other. I think the more that we can understand of the different traditions, then the more whole we become, the less we're going to say, oh, you know, we, lest we're going to partmentalize the, <laughs> the body of Dharma, you might say, which is, you know, we're the body of Dharma. So, no, the, the mind is such that it, um, it develops compassion. It's a natural response when certain um, selfish mind states are, are overcome, that we respond to others as self. And it's not a Buddhist thing, you know. Jesus said, we all know that line, you know, look after your, your neighbor as you would like yourself to be looked after, or love your neighbor as you'd like to be loved yourself. You know, this is through all tradition. It's a human. You know, the compassion is a human. We, we, what was that line that I said? It's a, sort of a human given. We, we should understand it. We have incredible skills compared to, you know, a variety of skills compared to most animals, most beings. And so we can use those for the benefit of ourselves and others. That's what it's about. That's what we're practicing for. 
So don't get upset if something sounds a little bit biased towards your tradition. <laughs> or if anything I say, which can be very easily done, you know, and I'm sure I've offended many people over the many years I've been sitting here. <laughs> you know, for many years I gave these pretty dry Zen talks and I tell you, there were three or four in this room that would get them. <laughs> and, and still people came to listen. One, one person said to me, well, I have no idea what you're talking about, it, but it seemed fascinating or it sounded really interesting, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't get offended too much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. You very uh, clearly uh, explain what compassion is, like understanding the other being. But then you describe the, in Mahayana tradition, you understand the suffering of the other being. Now, what I understand, compassion is just understanding the other person exactly. Yeah. But uh, when you understand the suffering, then you do something for that. But you can also be understanding the joy or happiness of other person. That's right. Mm -hmm. Because we normally do something for somebody when you see suffering of yes. other being. Yeah. So very often we relate the compassion to what you do after having understood the suffering. If you may go to a soup kitchen and make some soup, people say that is compassion. Yeah. Some money is compassion. But really, not, it is an yeah. internal thing of yours that the understanding of the other being. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's, that's true. What, but what happens is out of uh, my action, the other can, situation can be alleviated, yes. the problem in the situation. That's what it is more about. Yes. Um, it, you know, the, the empathetic aspect of compassion from a Mahayana point of view um, is part of that resonance, is, is where you can actually go down the wrong way. You know, it's, it's where you can actually become... Um, very drained by it. You know, you get what's called, as many carers do, many people in caring professions, they become um, uh, overloaded with this weight of an empathetic um, responding, taking on too much that the other's um, pains. And I mean, this is something in Mahayana that gets discussed on many levels. And Joan has a, an interesting way of talking it, but it is mostly about, um, this thing doesn't slide up and down very well. Uh, it is mostly about the cultivation in your own heart and mind. So, you know, that little exercise showed that if you thought about that other person that you're communicating with recently. So I bet all of you thought of someone you're having a problem with <laughs> or had, a, had an engagement in conversation that wasn't so pleasant. I don't know. But by actually letting go of what I'm wanting out of that situation, that's why I ask those questions. What do you want? What do you think that person expected? When I did this exercise in regard to the Vietnamese lady, I found it very powerful. I found I could even step right back into what I did was fine. But there were times that overload, you know, I either said too much or responded in a way that brought out aggression, that brought out certain reaction. Where had I just sat there and said very little and then at the end just said, well, I think it's great you come here, but maybe you have to just first do A, B, C first. Go home, sort out, pack your bags and come back. Now, had I just sat there, listened to it all, taken it all, I think the outcome would have been much better. But I had a slight... when. She turns up to stay. I had a slight concern. Well, you know, this could be drastic <laughs> for her, you know, the people she's looking after. So I learned something from this. That's why I shared it today. 
it, it does come from within. Absolutely. Everything comes from within. But it also comes from our response and our relationship. It's never one-sided. And it's much more subtle than that. As you learn in meditation. You know, we sat in Korea. The person who sat next to me was less than a foot away. The cushions almost met. And we sat there three months, 12 to 16 hours a day meditating, eating, sleeping in this place. So you get to know <laughs> everything going on in that hall with 30, 40, 50 in a hall at one time for three months. So there are those subtler things. Yes, I'm responsible for my actions and my thoughts. But you do get to know the other very clearly. How I react to them, what I do with them is my responsibility. We never can take that away. But thank you, that's important to highlight that, very important. So if we don't have any more questions, anyone else? Oh, we've got another one. It's okay because now we've got extra time. <laughs> I just went and sat for half an hour in the kitchen last time. <laughs> Thank mm. you so much for the beautiful talk, uh, Sunim. Uh, ah, thank you. Just to mention, uh, you were saying this. Uh, you can take hall, your mask off while we're talking. Yeah. The, the hall was so silent because I think we all uh, had these kind of experiences in each of us. Ah, and that's yeah. why we all took it in. And it was like beautiful thank to think you. that way. I think that's why the silence was. Yeah. And the audience was so silent because of no, that. I didn't think you were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, with your experience, Sunim, um, you were saying that, like, basically, what you are saying is, in these experiences, you give more listening, have more listening skills, hmm. and then, then what happens is sometimes when you are listening too much, also like more attentively, the sympathy comes like that overpowers everything mm. and then you forget about your own like where you draw the line mm. where you have to absorb now that's another that. very that's important very point yeah difficult one yeah. yeah so just to check with you how <laughs> very very important I didn't somehow I might have skipped this little point you know where do we draw the line um you know, in every situation, and going back to what Dr. Chai said, where we are all responsible for our actions, um, good and bad, you know, we, we all make mistakes in how we communicate, and, you know, I'm a forerunner of that. Anyone who knows me very well has <laughs> known when the mouth has got in the way. But... Somehow, as we get older, we start to develop the capacity to listen. And I mean, when I'm saying listening, it's, there is a, a, a meditative silence in a way, but at the same time, um, those other factors that I've shared in Grace, the capacity to be fully attentive as if we are meditating. You know, just the object in this case is a voice, is someone's voice, someone's presence. There's many things happening. If it's just on the telephone, it's a voice. If it's on Zoom, it's a voice, a face, but no pupils in the eyes. We can't see each other directly in the eyes. But the whole physical presence of someone communicating share a lot beyond what they're just what's coming out of their mouth. And sometimes we have to be um, in that firmness that I mentioned. We have also to create boundaries, protective protection. We have to know when to step back when to pause 
a conversation, you know. So that's a skillful capacity to be able to interact where it is important. So the person doesn't just get overstressed in retelling their story over and over and over again, which was the case here. Um, I, I had believed a total different situation. I didn't realise until she came what the real story was. But there's cultural aspects that we may not understand. And I know what that's like to live in a culture a long time and not understand, you know. We have this word... Um, oh, it's gone from my head. But anyway, it's a word that means uh, nunchi. Nunchi had a nunchi means that you have all the senses open all the time to try and calculate what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to respond in any situation. So I was known for having nunchi manta, I mean having a lot of nunchi, a lot of this capacity. <laughs> I was like just this globe because I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know what they're talking about. I didn't understand the culture. And the mannerisms, I didn't know if they were angry. I used to think, why are they fighting all the time? And I said to somebody when this occurred, and they said, well, they're talking about the weather. It's, no one's fighting here. It was, it was a passionate engagement about the weather. Now, can you believe it? I said, all this time I thought, you know, this language is about people being aggressive. I mean, in a way, there is a little bit of that too in that culture. But there is a level, you know, that's different to our level. And um, so there are these other nuances, these other situations that imbue everything. And there is a time to step back, even to walk away. But you end it in a way, in some way, that you're not going to carry that with you for the rest of the day or into the next situation, because you can carry your angst, your frustration, your anger, your fear, right into that next person that you communicate with. So it is so important that somehow we find a way to also end it here. So even if you're going to turn away and say, you say, oh, well, we can, let's, let's, re-engage with this at another time. You know, I have something I have to do now. Well, let's talk about it at another time. Let's continue the conversation. Or you can also say, well, I think so-and-so may be much more appropriate to help you here. You know, I had an alcoholic calling me at 2 o'clock in the morning one night, you know, and I had to guide him to his refrigerator to see if there was any food in there. And, you know, I, I don't know if this was right because I didn't know what to do at 2 o'clock in the morning with an alcoholic. You know, do you have any alcohol in the house? Yes. You know, well, what I suggest you do is you go out the back door and you <laughs> smash it on the ground. Now, you know, maybe I wouldn't have said that be at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> I might have said, go and give it to your neighbour or something, you know. <laughs> But he was so desperate. And so, you know, then I helped him make a sandwich and eat his sandwich. Then I helped him go to sleep. And then I said in the morning, then you call Alcoholics Anonymous or you call a helpline. And I gave him a number and um, never heard from him again. But in that time, he told me many things about what he does. You know, can you turn your car on? No, good. You know, where do you get the alcohol on down the road? You know, do, do they not stop you? So we could have a discussion. So, you know, that's not affecting me. I don't, you know, I'll listen to someone at two o'clock in the morning. But I wasn't that skilled about what to do. I'm a little bit more skilled now. It was many years ago. So there are times and... I did think, oh, did I do the right thing? So that's where it has to finish. And you accept what you've done as you've done. 
what you've said as you've said. Not judge yourself. Self-judging doesn't help. It just becomes a pattern of self-criticism and self... Yeah. Um, self it's another form of self-interest. You know, uh, self-empowering in a way, <laughs> sort of. But it's not skillful. Mm. But thank you for that question. Very important one. Boundaries are important. And actually, if something is a concern or out of your depth, you don't go there in the beginning. You give them advice of where they can get help or who to communicate with. That's the most skillful. Something you feel not sure about, you don't go there. Thank you. So, enjoy the rest of your day. If you have time, please come and share a meal. Thank you.